an area in the Quran where we were talking in the last Jum'ah, when Allah says, Yukara bismi rabika al-kalaka, kalaka in sand. And the reason we wanted to talk about that, because it's really a, a long subject, it says, um, say or proclaim that uh, Allah, or proclaim that the Lord, Rabbi, the nourisher of man, the creator of man, Allah. And <clears throat> say, create man. And a lot of times, we, when we think about man, we think in terms of the physical, the physical uh, part of the human being which usually leads us to a misunderstanding in what this is talking about. And it leads to a misunderstanding because it's kind of hard to say man and not think masculine. And it's kind of hard to think masculine and not think man. But the way Allah uses it in the Quran, He uses it many, many times as in a feminine position to make us think and understand that he's not talking about the physical uh, person. He's not talking about the gender. He's not talking about our physical um, appearance or our physical status. He is talking about the, what happens through that status. What happens through it. He's talking about behavior. Behavior. He's talking about the behavior of something. And the behavior is that of a creature he created to be the Vaisujin, to be the Khalifa of, of the creation, to be the Khalifa of the creation. <clears throat> now, Khalifa in itself has a particular responsibility. This Khalifa has a particular responsibility. Many of the explanations for the word tells us that Khalifa talks about control talks about the ability to control, the ability to change, the ability to reform, the ability to reshape, the ability to study, the ability to examine. The word is, is much deeper than the small value we give it. Many times we give it uh, a, a little word like guardian. But Khalifa, in order to be the Khalifa, you have to understand the meaning. You can't be the Khalifa if you can't make decisions. You can't be the Khalifa if you can't change something. You can't be the Khalifa if you're not in, in control. And you cannot be the Khalifa if you cannot say that. Cannot be. That's a requirement. Of Khalifa. So when Allah says he's going to create, he says create. When he's going to create or make, create a Khalifa in the Ferrari. Going to create a Khalifa in the Ferrari, he means he's going to create something that has the power and control to change and shape, to make things as he sees fit. This is why the angels couldn't understand it. This is why the angels, the Melaika, they said, why would you create something that's going to bring about bloodshed? You see, they didn't see that this kind of bloodshed is just a term that you bring about trouble, bring about uh, uh, causing fitna in the, in the creation. But they couldn't see. Allah says, I know what you know not. So they couldn't see it. They couldn't see something with this great power, this uh, omnipotent power, to change the physical and the mental and the social development of the creation. That's what Khalifa means. It's not just something to sit around and we go home and watch television. That's not the meaning of Khalifa. That's some misguided human being. The meaning of Khalifa is one to change. In fact, in the word Khalifa, there's a meaning of that. First word, the Khalifa, the Khalifa, you know it comes from 
the word Kalak. Kalak is the creator. But man can't be the creator, so he's the Kalak. The see, you hear the sound? Khalifa. It changes because man is not the creator. But man can, has attributes that was given to him by the creator which enables him to change things. That's where the term comes from. That's the meaning of that term. That's how that term evolves. The human being. And then also in that word is the power to say no. Let. Not only he say no to things that he he will not uh, accept. He can say no to his creator. That's how powerful that is. He can say, I don't believe in the creator. I don't believe in nothing except me. <laughs> he gave the Khalifa that power. So the Khalifa is not a small thing. It's not just another part of the creation. In some areas it's called the crown of the creation. It's like an explanation point on a statement. If you make a statement, and it's a statement of uh, a command statement, and you put a question mark on it, a person really going to have to understand the content to understand the question mark. Because the question mark could be, what are you doing? That's a question. But, if you ask in a young kid, what are they doing in terms of they're doing something they should not be doing? And you see them doing it. You say, what are you doing? They know you mean you ain't supposed to be doing that. You see, the question now becomes a command. But it depends on what? It depends on the way it's used, the content. And that's the way it is with the Khalifa. Khalifa, all the... Malaika saw was the, the trouble that can come from the creation of the Khalifa. They didn't see the whole thing. They didn't see the whole picture. They didn't see the beauty. They didn't see the, the, the changing of this whole creation become to be something wonderful. They didn't see that. They just saw the trouble that can come about by a creature having the power to say no to his creator. You know, when the law created man in the form that man could evolve and he put in that saying he says created man in, in tribes and cultures and things of that nature see when you read those terms and you read that in the Quran it doesn't necessarily mean that Allah created um, different cultures and different tribes separately what it means, it means that Allah created man with the potential to become different tribes, to become different languages, to become different cultures. It was created, man, the instant man was created, instant the Khalifa was created, all of those things were present in the Khalifa at the same time. It just was a matter of time and a matter of experience and a matter of the relationship between the human being and the earth and his environment as to those things becoming evident. When man first appeared on the earth, most, 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 most scientists agree that it was in Ethiopia, on the equator. And if the human being comes, is created on the equator and do not have protection, the, the rays from the sun will kill the human being. Burn him up. Burn up his cells because he wouldn't have the protection. You can't take a, a person from uh, 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 Switzerland blonde head, blue eyes from Switzerland and put them on the equator in the sun without any protection. So Allah created man with the ability to have that protection against the sun. He created melanin in the skin, melanin in the bones, melanin in the, in the nature of the human being so that he would be able to fight off those gamma rays and the rays that would kill and burn up the cells. The melanin would fight it off and make the human being Strong. Make the human being be able to exist in his environment. And that same melanin, it activates the pineal gland. And the 
pineal gland activates melatonin. And the melatonin goes toward memory in the human brain. It helps the human brain to develop quicker, his motor skills quicker. Because you have to remember movement. You have to remember, all those things have to be registered in the brain. You don't just do something. No, you do a little bit and you remember that and you do a little bit more and you remember that. But it all happens simultaneously. So that was to help the human being to develop as fast as he could develop. There's no other creature on the earth could develop as fast as a human being develop under those conditions. Unless he has those qualities. And those were the qualities that Allah had in the human being when he created the human being. With everything. And as the human being migrated northward and southward and eastward, he began to change over thousands of years. This is a thousands of years process. I know some have been taught in different philosophies and different concepts that this all took place 6,000 years ago. And boom, man puffed up and he was driving around in a Cadillac and driving a, and cutting his hair and everything else. They think that that's what man was doing. Walking around the Edwardian suits and all that kind of stuff. No, no, no. We got to get into the reality of the thing. The reality is that man came on this planet and was created on this planet and all other creatures. He came naked and bare just like they did. That proves how powerful Allah is. Because Allah gave man something to rise up from that position. He gave man intellect. And he said this intellect will rise up from the same position that all other creatures are created on. To prove that this is my Khalifa. You see, it's not a difficult process when we're giving it straight. But when we're giving all of these uh, fairy tales, all these mysteries, it's very difficult to understand that. So as man migrated, he began to break off, he multiplied. And man was smart enough to understand that they had to also band together to survive because there were other creatures around. Much bigger, much, much more deadly than man. Man had to become an engineer of his existence. He had to learn how to survive in an environment that on the surface looked like it was against him. On the surface, the environment the man was in looked like everything was, was preying on him. But man survived. Man became the architect of that same environment that threatened him. That's some powerful stuff when we look at it. When we look at what Allah did when he said Khalifa, see we got to look at the whole word. We got to look at the meaning in and out. How does this thing work? What makes it work? And as the Khalifa moved and grew in numbers, and it grew apart from me. One band going to one side, another band going to another side. And over hundreds of years, they just started developing different languages. And different cultures. And different concepts. That's what Allah says when he created man. He created the languages. He created the cultures. He created, he was talking about in, in the one creation, all of that existed. And it just was a matter of time when it started coming out. And you would see his word is to be true. You will see his word is actual. When we look at it, then we get to understand what Allah is talking about. But if we're in a dream world, a fairy tale world, we can never understand it. If we're in a fairy tale world, thinking that man is a poof, and all of a sudden he's here, then we could never understand it. The Quran. The Quran is put in a language. Allah put it in a language, put the Quran in a language. And most people say, yeah, it's in the Arabia. Arabia, Arabia Quran. That's the written and spoken language. But what is the language of content? What's the language that gives you the meaning of what you're reading? Give you the meaning of what's shown in the Quran. What's that language? What is the language that, that, that causes the Quran to move from generation to generation? Through thousands and thousands of years, no matter what language reads it, no matter what culture involves.
involves itself with it. What is the language that maintains the structure of what Allah was saying in the Quran? It's a picture language. It's a picture language. It's a picture language. The language, everything that Allah wanted us to know and understand, he put it in the form of pictures. Told stories on what actually was going to happen. You see, when you, when you read the Quran, you read the book that's talking about prophecy at one time. It's prophesizing. Telling you that this is going to happen. But it tells you in the form of hadith. It tells you in the form of a hadith. You know, hadith means stories. Allah calls them hadiths. He said, this is the hadith of Ibrahim. This is the hadith of... He tells us right on who did the hadith of. So when you read that, now you get a picture. But what are you getting a picture of? You're not looking at history when you read Ibrahim. You're looking at the future. When you read Esau, you're not looking at history. You're looking at the future. And that future had to come into an existence. And then once that future came into existence, then it became history. That's Quran. That's understanding Quran. Now, you read Quran, and Allah says, a virgin, without the agents of a man, had a child. A virgin had a child. Where do where does your mind go? Where does your understanding evolve from? What perception do you have? To help you with that picture. It's a big thing. Depending on what perception you have. To help you with that picture. Now the Christian means the same picture. And there's a form in Judaism. Where he also talk about something very similar. Same picture. Now yet we have to understand that. Allah is the one who revealed Torah. So there's very powerful words in there. And Esau, with the India, a lot of that, when you look at the, the Bible, you see what they call the Old Testament, New Testament. You look in the New Testament, they say that was the time of Esau, but that's not true either. They, they don't tell you that right out, but most people assume that. Some of the Bibles even go as far as only the red in the New Testament is what they think Esau said. Only the red printed. They, even, they go that far and try to give you that much of the truth. Because the rest of it wasn't. It was either Mark, Luke, Jacob. All of these names were people. Peter, Paul. These were people who wrote that book. They wrote it from a basis of their understanding of what they thought Esau represented. What they thought Esau represented and the time represented, they wrote that, they gave it, it's even called their letters. It's even called their revelation. But even in all of that mist, even in all of the different authors, Allah is still the guy. Allah is still Akbar. No matter how much confusion or how they turn things in different ways to suit different situations, Allah is Akbar. And you can't get away from that. You can't tell a lie unless you use the truth. There's no way to do that. There's no way to create something that doesn't exist that Allah had already caused it to come into existence. So when you tell a lie, you're using the truth that Allah created. Allah is all truth. So even in the Bible, if you understand the symbolism, if you understand the logic of the Quran, then you can read the Bible with some enlightenment. You can read the Bible with some understanding. But if you don't have that, and which most people do not have, they read the Bible as a confused child. They read the Bible like a confused child with no guidance. Because there's no reality. There's no reality to the stories that they find in the Bible. There's no
no reality to the story that Paul was sitting up on the roof. After he went on the journey, sitting on the roof, and the angel came to him and brought him some food and said, eat of the food. Eat. And Paul said, I cannot eat because some of this is unclean. Talking about the pork. It's unclean. I can't eat unclean. This is our law. Then it says that the angel said, whatever Allah cleans, whatever God cleans, is clean unto you. Now for an innocent Christian, not understanding that that's all symbolic language and what the sim symbolism means, somebody can encourage that person to eat pork. Simply because, and, and they've been, and pork is a, there's in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and all of the books of, in the Torah that you cannot eat pork. But here's a contradictory position over here in the New Testament. It says again, now here's a Christian who's sincere at heart. He's innocent. He want to follow God. That's in his nature because it's natural for the human being to follow Allah. It is not natural for the human being to follow Shaitan. We weren't created to follow Shaitan. Allah says in the Quran, he created both jinn and men to serve him. So not even Jesus are supposed to follow anything except Allah. <coughs> so but here's an innocent Christian without understanding of what these symbols are, what these symbols mean. And he's led by preachers who won't tell them. They won't tell them what they mean because they're afraid they'll lose them as followers. They're afraid if they tell the Christian the truth about the Bible and the symbols of the Bible that the Christian will stop following them. That's what they're afraid of. So they keep the Christian sedated. And when Karl Marx came along, you know the communist Karl Marx? He said, Religion is the opium of the people. That's powerful. That is powerful. See, they washed that off by saying, Karl Marx, Karl Marx was a communist. Karl, no, he was telling the Christian that that religion is putting you to sleep. You can't wake up to the real world. You can't wake up to the material world. You can't wake up to the world and build a life for yourself because you're asleep to that world. And you only move in the direction that the leaders and the power brokers tell you to go. Because you don't have a thinking and a mind of your own. That's what he was saying. They didn't understand the symbols. Now, what about the Muslim? What about the Muslim? What about us? Do we have a mind of our own? I was talking to a brother the other day, and the first thing come out of his mouth, not whether or not you can understand what you're talking about, or what or not you can understand the Quran when you read it. He said, who taught you? And the answer is simple. Allah taught me in the Quran. Who taught you? And who taught the one before him? Who taught? If it wasn't the Quran, I don't want to hear it anyhow. That's the logic of it. You see, because they take you out the logic and give you this uh, mystical way of ex accepting things. Somebody has to teach you what Allah is saying. He's saying the same thing to you he's saying to them. What makes their mind any better than your mind? Allah has empowered the individual. Each person will stand on his own. This is what Allah is saying in the Quran. It is not your imam that you see talking to you or leading you in salat. It's your imam that's in you that's going to be on trial. It's the imam that's in you that's supposed to be leading you every day is going to be in the judgment. It won't be the brother who you heard down the street or the brother you heard up the street or the one here. It's going to be the one that's in you because that's the one that's with you all the time. That's the one that knows everything that happened in every situation.
mentioned in your whole life. And that's the one that's going to be either your witness for good or witness for, no, he was just messing up. But that's clear in Quran when you're reading it with a clear understanding. When you're reading it with a sober mind. When you see how Allah evolved his Khalifa. When you see that that, that is talking about Allah creating the Khalifa to be independent of the creation. Independent only on Allah. And that's not just talking about the, the imams or the, or the prophets or the messengers. No, it's not just talking about each individual. Each individual is independent of another individual in order to serve his Lord. You know, there's an ayah in Quran where Allah says, stand for justice. Oh, you who believe stand for justice, firmly for justice, and uh, be a witness to Allah, even if it's against yourself. You know what that does? That tells you there's a there's a, another ayah in the Quran that says, Ashur Bainahum talks about Ashur. And it says, This is, and it gives it in context with the principles of Islam. Fasting, zakat. It gives it with those principles. Three, three principles mentioned there, and that's one of the principles mentioned. But don't you know that when Allah says stand for justice, when he revealed this, even if it gets yourself, it negates. It negates Ashura. It negates anything. Justice comes first, Allah is saying here. He's empowering the individual again. Certainly he said we should do things through mutual consultation. We should, we we'll, our affairs, we should govern them through mutual consultation. But he comes back and tell us, justice comes first. If the group is doing something that's unjust, you should not be a part of it. I don't care if you're the only one that's standing by yourself. You should be standing for justice. You should be standing for truth. This is what Allah is saying to you. He's not saying because the majority went that way. Certainly we like to be in agreement with the majority. Certainly we like to everybody be working together. But when it's against justice, and Allah has put it in our heart and our understanding to see the imperfections and that idea and concept they're going with, we say laugh. We stand with justice. We stand firmly with justice. This is the power that Allah gives the individual. You have to not assume that power. You have to take on that power. And allow that power to be you. You have to be and understand that you are the Khalifa Allah was talking about. Every one of us. Individually. Collectively. This is not history. This is present. This is present. You're not reading history when you read Allah says he's going to create a Khalifa. Every time a baby is born there's another Khalifa. That's not history. That's present. The Quran is put in that beautiful language, that beautiful pictorial language, so it can pass through time. If it was put literally, if it was put literally, meant exactly what it was saying at that time, then it would change. Every time a generation come on, that wouldn't mean that, that if, it, if, if Allah says, pray and watch your back just for one generation, then you would lose the meaning of that. Pray, but tie your camel, you, you lose the meaning of that. We don't have any camels. No, it means even when you think you're right, move with great enthusiasm toward your belief in being right. Then you say, Inshallah, Allahu Akbar, you give Allah the credit, and at the same time, you're being cautious. You're saying, I'm going to do it if Allah wills it. you looking behind yourself. You're putting the weight on Allah. 
And you're not putting on the weight on Allah because of some great thing that came along. You're putting it on Allah because he told you to do it. Allah told you to put the weight on him. He said, don't start uh, uh, anything unless you put his name first. You can't even eat until you say, Bismillah. Bismillah. Bismillah leads with Allah. You see, so the whole idea is predicated on developing as an individual and becoming the best human being you can be. So with that, we want to take a short pause. Allah guides us clearly in the Quran and he, and he instructs us through Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu to do certain things and be a certain kind of person. As he instructs Prophet Muhammad, he even talks about how people who came before the Prophet, people who came before them, really don't have any reason not to accept him. There's a part in the Quran where Allah says, uh, say, say to them <coughs> that you are on the straight way, put on that path by Rabbi Alameen, Sarata Mustaqim. And this was the miller of Ibrahim. Hanif. See? This was the, the way of life of Ibrahim, the upright one. He was upright. So he said that. Allah commanded him to say that. He commanded him to say that to those who had faith or thought they had faith. <coughs> In Ibrahim, what Ibrahim bought, who was in the Torah, he said to them, I am on the straight way. I'm on the straight way. Allah, the same God you talking about put me on that straight way. That's the only way I can get there. I am following the miller, the way of Ibrahim. And he said to them, Ibrahim, you follow the way of Ibrahim, right? So you have no reason not to accept what I say. And he went on, and that guy goes on and say, my life and my death are all for Allah. And then at the end he said the same thing Ibrahim said in his um, 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 dua. I am of those who submit. I am Muslim. I am Muslim. Now, <clears throat> for the Muslim, we, we do understand that means that Allah created everything to submit to him. And during the time of Ibrahim, he was one of the first of all of the people, like prophets and messengers, who submitted his whole self. He turned away from the gods of old and the ones his fathers and everyone had. And he says, I'm Muslim. Meaning that he knew in his nature his nature was created to follow Allah. That's what he, he found out. He found out the nature of the human being is created to follow its creator. And the nature of the human being is not to follow something the human being creates. That's not our nature. That's a human being creating that. So he says that's eternal from that. He says it's in our nature to follow that which created us. I am Muslim. 
This is what he declared. Because his nature was Muslim. His nature was Muslim. <clears throat> so he declared it, then he said, I am Muslim. Now he says, whole self. He said, my whole self is Muslim. My life, my death, everything is Muslim. This part ain't for that, and that part ain't for this. He said, no, all of it is Muslim. And this is what Allah said to tell them, talking to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to tell them the same thing Ibrahim said. That's what you represent. And yet, many didn't accept. But for you and me today, we have the same question before us. We have the same situation before us. Oh, are we following what? Are we doing what? Is our whole self Muslim? Or just the part when we come to the Juma? And we put on our clothes and grow our beards. And, uh, or when we make the lack. Life. Death. Salat. Sadaka. All for Allah. All that's supposed to be Muslim. <clears throat> I guarantee you that if the, those who profess to be Muslim would really be Muslim, the whole world would change. I really believe that with all my heart, my soul, and everything I walk on and talk with, everything is in me. I believe that those who profess to be Muslim, forget about the Christian, forget about the Jew, forget about the agnostic, forget about the atheist, all of them. If those who say, profess they are Muslim, if they just be Muslim, the world would change. This is what Allah says in Quran. You are the exemplary community. You are the community going to make a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth, another heaven and another earth. It's all up to us. Each and every one of us. None is above the other. And none is below the other. We all are Muslim. So we thank Almighty Allah for blessing us to be here this day of Juma. We ask Allah to bless those who are unable to make it and had intended to make it. And those who have good in their heart. We ask Allah to give us the best of this world. And have of the hereafter and protect us from the fire. I mean, he comes.